She's an actress, she's a writer, she's a filmmaker, she's a mother, she's a wife, and she's a wonderful woman. So welcome, Susie. So tonight, I am going to be talking to you about prayer, obedience, and faithful trust. And if you're a bit concerned, thinking that sounds a, a bit boring, um, hopefully it won't be. I'm just going to tell you a few stories and hopefully encourage you. Perhaps you're thinking, I know everything there is to know about prayer, obedience, and trust. And if, if you do, that's awesome. Um, but I just say what my wise uncle said to me, it's not how much you know, it's how deep you know it. So my prayer has been that um, some, of this, um, some of the things that I'm going to say tonight will just help those truths to root deeper into your heart. So I'm actually going to read um, from James tonight. I realized I didn't bring my Bible from my bedroom, so I'm going to read it off my phone. So I'm reading from James 5, verses 7 to 18. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you'll be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no. Otherwise, you'll be condemned. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they sin, they'll be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the earth and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. So I'm just going to be pulling out a few things from that passage tonight. Um, no heavy exposition, just a few little points. I um, had quite a journey of prayer over the years. I've been a Christian since I was a child, and I've always prayed about stuff. But something happened to me a few years ago, which I'm just going to quickly share with you. Um, I had written a book which um, had kind of gone on the back burner. I tried to get it published. It was a modern, re a modern version of a book called The Diary of Private Prayer by John Bailey. It's a Christian classic. And I'd written a new edition. I'd been asked by the, the family, the Bailey family, to write a new edition of this book for a contemporary audience. And I'd failed to get it published, and it had been on the back burner. And my husband and I were living in North London. We were working on some council estates there with people there, and to be honest, it was pretty tough. And we had, I'd got burnt out, which I think happens to us all at times, but I had um, got completely burnt out and had to sort of pull back from ministry for a while. And um, someone sent me a book in that time, which was called The Circle Maker. I don't know if anyone's read it here, but it's a book on prayer. And I looked at it and thought, oh, great, another Christian book to read and put it to one side. But actually, um, a friend of mine who I really respected had sent it to me, and I thought, well, I better have a look. And it was a book about prayer, and it was encouraging people to pray circles around their greatest dreams and their biggest fears. And I started to think, what are my dreams? I had got to the point where, to be honest, I was pretty depressed, and I kind of wondered if I'd ever carry on a ministry. I wondered what was going to happen next. And I wondered if I had any dreams anymore. And I said to the Lord, what would you like me to pray about? And I, said, I felt him say to me, well, why don't you pray for that book to get published that you spent like eight years writing? Um, eight years alongside changing nappies in life and everything else. I didn't spend the whole time just at my desk. And um, I was like, okay. So I started to get up at six in the morning and, and pray, which is really early for you know, the little ones. That was like a big commitment. And I started to pray. And um, I felt, again, just a little nudge, like, have a little look and see who published the original version of this book. So I went online and I found out that it was a major publishing house in New York that had published this book. Um, 
and I thought, oh, well, I'll just get in touch with them. I'll just email them, maybe call them, and ask them if they'd like to publish this new edition. And so I went on the website and discovered, of course, that there was no uh, email or phone number. They don't want to hear from anyone, really, basically. Um, they only want to hear from literary agents, and they don't want people to just to submit their work. So I was a bit discouraged, and um, I went back to prayer. And I, I was praying again, and I just decided to go back to the website. And I looked, and I saw on the website that there was an office in London, which was about a mile and a half from my house. And in the book, The Circle Maker, he talks about going and, um, like Joshua, to Jericho. He um, didn't actually fight the Battle of Jericho initially. The Lord said to him, I've given Jericho into your hands. And he circled Jericho seven times, seven days, and then seven times on the last day. And it was the prayer that made the walls come tumbling down. So I felt quite inspired. And I decided to go down there. I had like three hours in a week when my daughter was in nursery and my son was in school. I had three precious hours. And I spent that those hours every week walking down to, to um, this publishing house in London and circling it seven times in prayer and walking back. And I felt like a bit of a nutcase, actually, if I'm honest with you. And I think the security guard started to give me a few looks. I was like, a little bit like, it's not me again. It is me again. And, um, and I would come back from those prayer times completely exhausted because prayer is actually really hard work. And I had sent an email previously to the family of the original author, to the person that owned the rights of the book, and I'd said, do you know anyone within this publishing house I could get in touch with? And I'd heard nothing. After weeks and weeks of um, praying, going down and doing this crazy kind of vigil, uh, I got fed up, actually. And I said to the Lord, um, well, before I say what I said, I'll explain. In, in this book, The Circle Maker, he talks about the guy called, this guy called Chuck Yeager, who um, broke the sound barrier. I don't know if you've heard of him, but he, he um, managed to fly his plane so fast that he broke the sound barrier. And he got that sonic boom um, that they used to have on Concord. And it, he talks about in the book about kind of having this sonic boom in prayer, like when you've been praying and praying, and, and like with the planes, everything sort of might seem even just fall apart, but then you kind of get this boom, this sort of breakthrough, either in your heart or practically speaking, when you know that God's answered your prayer. And I was walking along down in King's Cross, and I just said, God, I am so sick of praying. I'm so sick of praying. I just want to feel that boom, like Mark Batterson talks about in his book. And I looked up, and I saw this. And if you can't see it, it says, here comes the boom. Okay, that was like one minute later, I saw that. And um, incredibly, um, within a week, I was speaking to the senior editor at this publishing house, and um, they were asking me to send their manus my manuscript over to them. And again, I heard, I heard nothing from them, so... I was like, oh, maybe they don't like it. Oh, okay, all, all I knew what to do was pray. I didn't know anyone in the publishing world. I didn't have any contacts. I wasn't particularly well connected. All I knew what to do was pray. So I kept going back down and praying. And the thing that I was praying was that God would prime the hearts of these editors um, with his Holy Spirit and that they would get back to me. And after a month went by and one evening I got an email and it just said, um, dear Susanna, just to circle back to you, we are primed to go forward with your new edition. And no one said circle back, everyone kind of says it now, I'm going to circle back to you, no one said it then. But it was incredible wording, because they circled back to me and they were primed to go forward with my new edition. And incredibly, the book ended up being published, and in fact, as well, it's the story of what happened, which is a bit more detailed than how I've explained it tonight has been put in the Circle Maker, the new edition, which is actually a New York Times best-selling book, and the author's put it in the story in a couple of his books now. And um, I look back on that, and some people say to me, how did you get your book published? How did you get it published? But I, I can only say, well, honestly, prayer. Prayer is the only thing that made a difference for me. After that, doors opened for me in the publishing world. It was quite exciting. Um, so I started to try and write another book, but actually I started to read other books that I kind of thought were actually better than, than my book. And I realized, I started to sense that this is not what I was meant to do. 
I'm still very much in mumland, which is a lovely place to be, and I love my kids with all my heart. Um, but with life focused on them and ministry, I sort of started to kind of lose my way a bit. And I started to have a bit of a very controlled midlife crisis. Uh, not a crazy one, just kind of actually quite a sad and lonely one, where I felt this huge weight of a question on the back, on my back, which was, what is the one thing that I've been made to do, God? What is my purpose? What is my unique contribution to planet Earth going to be? And anyone who's carried around a huge question mark on their back will know it's pretty tiring. But one day I just spontaneously said while I was driving, what if I am a filmmaker? I've just never made a film. And somehow in that prayer time, God unearthed a deep dream that had been in me for a really long time. I couldn't really do a lot with it at the time, except pray and hope and start writing screenplays. I knew I had to honour the commitments that I already had, like raising my kids and supporting my husband in the ministry and helping at church and continue to obey God in the small things and in the daily things and in the hard things and trust that he would do the rest. That was what I knew I had to do. And I guess I want to ask you tonight, like how, how is God calling you to obey? Because God requires obedience of all of us. Obedience is actually what qualifies us. I was recently struck by the fact that I looked through the Bible for people who were qualified to do the things that God had called them to do. And this is the list. Next slide, please. Yeah. <laughs> N.A. There aren't any. Okay. If you look in the Bible, all the people who did amazing, great stuff like Moses, Elijah, Ruth, Paul, all of those people, they weren't qualified to do what they did. Okay, you look at Moses, okay, he was a stutterer, he couldn't even speak, he said, Lord, I can't go and speak to, to Pharaoh in Egypt. But then you look at Joseph, of course, he had an MA in business, he had been to a seminar in California on soft power, oh no, wait a minute, he'd been in prison, and he'd been in the dark, and he'd been betrayed, but he was obedient to the Lord. And a lot of these people in the Bible went through long seasons of like desert themed or prison themed obscurity before God brought them to their big life purpose. Even look at Jesus, you know, we don't know very much about his life before he was 30, but he was the personification of obedience. Not even he was qualified to be a teacher or a healer, he was a carpenter. But he said, I only do what I see my father doing. He obeyed even to the point of dying on the cross to take away the sins of the world and restore our relationship with God. And what did God do? He rose him up from the dead. He beat sin and death because he was obedient. So I was spurred on by this kind of breakthrough that I had in prayer with the publishing house and everything that had happened with that. And I started to pray for connections in the film industry. And living in Hounslow, to be honest with you, there aren't, it's not really kind of like a magnet for well-connected people. Um, and I, I, I actually heard of a one Hollywood actor who I knew was a Christian and a Hollywood director who, was a new, who I knew was a Christian. I won't say the names because I know it's being filmed. So anyway, I was just like, Lord, actually, I'd really like to connect with them and send them my screenplay. I started to pray these crazy prayers. And um, amazing, one, one night I was um, driving my daughter to ballet and I was inside um, the church, when it was like a hall. She was doing ballet and someone came in and said, whose car is that parked out, outside, that silver car? I said, oh, that's mine. He said, can you please move it? So I went outside and I said, um, you know, what's all this? And he said, oh, I, I'd driven over their cables. And he said, well, we're filming a film here tomorrow. And I said, oh, what film it is, is it? And he told me, so I immediately went on my phone, IMDB, what film is it? And it turned out it was this very actor that I wanted to connect with was there the next day. So I went home that night and I was like, this is too much of a coincidence. I have got to do something. So I wrote him a letter and I got my script together and I went down to the film set the next day and um, a number of famous people were there and it was very exciting. And I just asked to speak to him. And he was inside filming, but his, his personal assistant came out and she talked to me and I gave her the script. She was really, really nice. 
and I gave her my number and I kind of left it at that and I walked away and I was like, yes, this is amazing. I mean, what are the chances in Hounslow? Um, and then um, I got a phone call from my husband and he said to me, could you come to church? The bishop's visiting. Can you just come and say hello? So I was kind of busy. I was like, okay, I'll go. So I went down um, to say hi to the bishop and the bishop said to me, Susie, are you going to write another book? And I said, no, actually, I want to, I'm writing a screenplay and I'm trying to get into film. He went, oh, that's funny. I've just been helping so-and-so, the Hollywood director that I wanted to connect with, um, with the theology for his next film. I'll connect you if you want. All in one day. All in one day. Someone said, every act of obedience opens a door. And I love that. I love that phrase. Every act of obedience opens a door. And I think it's true. And so I've worked in film for three years now, and I've been writing. Last year I even went to Jamaica filming, which was really exciting. And I'm currently in the middle of finishing four short films, which I shot earlier this year. It's all really, really small, but God is revealing my future to me step by step, but it's through obedience. So once we have prayed and obeyed, we've got to trust, right? We've got to faithfully trust. The passage that I just read says, like a farmer waiting for the spring rains to be patient. And I think trust is really hard on its own. But I kind of had this picture of it being like one of those wagons that a child sits in and someone else pulls along. And trust is like the child in that wagon. It can't go very far on its own. But with prayer and obedience, pulling it along, it can really go places. And trust can be full of hope and exciting because God takes a long time to answer prayer sometimes as we all know my freedom bible which I've got at home says I like this translation he says you remember how patient Job was and how God finally helped him it was like the translator really knows that God can take a really long time sometimes and took a long time it seems to answer Job does everyone know what FOMO is yeah, fear of missing out. It's a thing, okay? See this penguin here? It's missing out, okay? It's fear of missing out. And my daughter gets serious FOMO when she's not, like, around the action and the party. Earlier, we looked at Elijah. We talked about Elijah, the man just like us in the rain. Well, his pre apprentice was called Elisha. And he was with Elijah the day that Elijah knew that God was going to take him away from the earth. And I look at Elisha and I think, that guy had FOMO. Because if you look at the story right, Elijah says to him, I'm going off to Gilgal. Elisha, you stay here. Elisha's like, no, 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 I'm coming with you. They get to Bethel. Sorry, they get to Gilgal. And then Elijah says, I'm going to Bethel. And Elisha says, I'm coming with you. Elijah says, no, he says, no, no, I'm coming with you. And then they get to Bethel and Elijah says, Elisha, you stay here. I'm going across the Jordan to Jericho. And Elisha says, I swear that I am not going to leave you. And so Elijah gets the picture and they go off together to Jericho. And then before um, Elijah dies, or he doesn't die, he goes up to heaven. But before he goes, um, he says to Elisha, what would you like me to ask God for you? And Elisha says, I want a double portion of your spirit. Now Elijah had performed a lot of miracles, he'd done a lot of amazing things, but that wasn't enough for Elisha. He wanted a double portion. He wasn't going to miss out on what God might have for him. He wasn't going to wait in Gilgal or Bethel or Jericho or anywhere else. He was just going to keep pursuing Elijah and keep pursuing God. Most of the time I don't get FOMO when I look on social media or see someone else's career or finances. But I have got FOMO, like Elisha, for one thing. And I would encourage you to have FOMO for it too. And that is God's kingdom. You know, you don't want to miss out on what he has got for you, what he's going to do through you, and what he's going to do in you. And there's the kind of FOMO protection plan is prayer, obedience, and trust. Because if you do these three things, then you are not going to miss out on the things that God has got for you. Recently, I attended an, an awards ceremony at a film festival in London where a film I did last year had been nominated. And I got in the room and I looked around and I thought, man, everyone is younger than me here. And then I started to think, this is ridiculous. I should be further on than I am. Most people my age, 41, 
are at the peak of their career. They're not just starting out. But then I remember Jesus, and he shows me that I am like this. I've got roots, right? I've got roots, baby. <laughs> and those roots have been grown in the dark, in nappy changes, in an unglamorous life of being a stay-at-home mom, in the obscurity and difficulty of ministry in urban priority areas, in health struggles and isolation, in burnout and daily discipline. I've grown roots, and I'm ready to grow because of prayer, obedience, and trust. So tonight, I just want to comfort you if you're disturbed with these words. And I'd quite like to disturb you if you're comfortable. In prayer, if you've given up praying big prayers or crazy prayers, ask the Lord what he wants you to pray for. Ask him to give you big dreams and pray them into fruition. One tiny um, little example, if you go back a slide actually, it's just this, someone said to me recently, pray your crazy prayers. One crazy prayer I'll just quickly share with you that I prayed was, when, this, when the book was published, I prayed that um, someone famous would read it and that they would tweet about it and that, that would cause lots of people to buy it because I didn't have time to publicize it. I couldn't work out or could be, I just didn't know anything about having a platform or any of that kind of stuff. That sounded like a lot of stuff I didn't know about and didn't have time for. So I just prayed that crazy prayer and I was like, Lord, may someone do that. And I prayed that prayer four years ago. And the reason I did that is because one of my dreams was for the royalties of the book to go to the church ministry that we were doing. And so I really wanted to sell lots of copies so it could finance the ministry in, in urban areas and poor areas. And about four months ago, I got an email and uh, it was saying, have you seen this article? And I looked the article up and it, it said that Chance the Rapper, the Grammy award winning rapper in America, uh, with nine and a half million followers on Instagram, had posted about my book, that he was reading it and that he was using it for a sabbatical. And after that, like, it was amazing, like, it, the, in annual sales, he, it sold another year's worth in, like, a couple of weeks. And the church got a great big fat check, like, two weeks ago, which was just so exciting. So that's a crazy prayer, crazy answer to prayer. Why not pray it, you know? So I want to encourage you to pray your crazy prayers. And I want to encourage you in obedience. Maybe take some time to ask yourself, in what area is God calling you to greater obedience? Maybe in work, maybe in relationships, maybe in finances, maybe in daily disciplines. I want to encourage you that every act of obedience, no matter how small, opens a door somehow. And in trust, is there an area in your life where God is calling you to hold your nerve, to hang on to that word that he gave you so long ago? I just want to encourage you not to give up. I'm just going to finish with a poem which has been attributed to Sir Francis Drake. Probably heard it before, but remember what I said at the beginning. It's not how much you know, it's how deep you know it. So allow the words to sink in. Disturb us, Lord, when we are too well pleased with ourselves, when our dreams have come true because we have dreamed too little, when we arrived safely because we sailed too close to the shore. Disturb us, Lord, when with the abundance of things we possess, we have lost our thirst for the waters of life. Having fallen in life, love with life, we have ceased to dream of eternity. And in our efforts to build a new earth, we have allowed our vision of the new heaven to dim. Disturb us, Lord, to dare more boldly, to venture on wider seas where storms will show your mastery, where, losing sight of land, we shall find the stars. Thank you. Amen.